Um, thank you for coming back, all of you. I hope you enjoyed the coffee and you have time to exchange uh, some ideas. So now we are going to talk about the challenges that the evolution of the air navigation system will bring for the different stakeholders. It is my pleasure to introduce to you to the IATA director responsible for representing the airline industry at ICAO, covering the technical, economic, and other political fields. Mike Comber. Mike, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, we have a pretty decent turnout here. Thank you. Thank you for choosing us, uh, knowing you have other options. Uh, we're realistic, so uh, we imagine that the uh, minus 30 windshield factor out there had a little influence on this. I mean, you wake up at the hotel, you see that deep blue sky, lovely sun, etc. You go down, and when the door opens, reality hits. Welcome to Montreal. And this is a very cozy room, so thank you for being here. Well, uh, in the previous session of this stream, we discussed the making of standards and the global plans. Uh, on this segment, we'll be talking about putting these into action. Uh, it might be worth uh, recalling the presentation made by Claude Hurley yesterday uh, on, the, on the opening of the SANIS, uh, when in, in a certain way, he questioned if our regular standard production sequence from panel to ANC review to state letter consultation was really covering all the dark corners that might come to haunt us when the rubber hits the road. And plans do have to be implemented. Poppy Kozo suggested we might be keeping things at a level too complex for the less initiated, leaving some players out of the game. We have, no doubt, a long time seen instances of success and others of painful learning experiences. If all that wasn't enough, when we're starting to get comfortable with what we have, we get these disruptors coming up, as Nancy Graham has just shown us. This reminds us that we might need to rethink our whole way of doing business. Now, some of the people who have actually made this happen will share their experiences with us. And, and hopefully, we'll also have a good exchange with you, because I mean, the, the, the great value of this whole exercise is, is to tap on your experience and, and collect it and, and, and run and do something with it later on. Our panel brings a wealth of experience, and it's a good crosscut of academic planning, ATM implementation, manufacturing, and actually flying. So without much ado, let's introduce our first speaker. Mitch, Mr. Richard Heinrich is the Director of Strategic Initiatives for the Commercial Systems Business Unit at Rockwell Collins. He's also representing the International Coordinating Council of Airline Industries Associations. I'm impressed I managed to remember that. Rick, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mike. So we are on a journey, okay? We aren't, there's not a beginning, there's not an end. We are on a journey. Earlier this morning, there was a question posed about, are we planning too much? Do we need a shorter planning horizon? And I'm going to talk a little bit about that today in the sense that there needs to be a balance between the short, the mid, the long. And we need to understand how all those pieces fit together. The early part will be about implementation. The mid and longer term will make, be making sure we are in, headed in the right direction. So there's a very famous American author, Lewis Carroll, who kind of frames this whole discussion. Because if we don't know where we're going, any road will take us there. And that's really the risk of not having an adequate plan in place. We need something with a vision of the future so that we know where we're headed. So we have the, uh, the, the core vision document that we're building from, the Global Air Traffic Management Operational Concept. That vision describes what is the future 
and why is it necessary, but it does not deal with the how it will be implemented. That is left to the activities of the Global Air Navigation Plan that really is how that operational concept will be manifested. The GAMP describes a performance-based approach that is incremental and flexible, but there's no end state because we, none of us have the vision of the end state. However, we are on a path, we are on a trajectory. And that's, that's really the basis of, of where the value comes to the users. We talked a bit about this morning about the structure of the GAMP from where we have the executive discussion levels that, that create our talking points. But it also goes into the more detailed elements of what those building blocks are, how those building blocks fit together, and so on. So how does the Global Air Navigation Plan add value uh, and ensure customer satisfaction? Well, there are several elements to that. First, it creates a common thread uh, for implementation dialogue and decision making. We all need to have a common way of talking with each other. It's, it defines performance ambitions. What are the things we are trying to accomplish and to what degree of performance do we hope they bring forward? The aviation system block upgrades provide a readiness roadmap of performance-based building blocks, including the described benefits. So within each of those building blocks, we know when they're ready, when they've been fielded, who we can rely on based on their fielding experience to help us move forward in different nations and in different implementations. But there has to be a symmetry in those uh, system block upgrades between the airspace user and the ground side. Without that symmetry, we have the chicken and egg discussion we discussed earlier this morning of how does one get ahead of the other. We really need to have them uh, in balance. That balance then ensures an establishing of a sequence of how we will move the system forward. It will not all happen at once. Okay, we've talked about the Big Bang Theory where it's all there. We don't have a clean sheet environment. We have to deal with the legacy infrastructure that's in place, both the flying infrastructure and the ground infrastructure. But we want to put forward a program or a definition or a plan where users can buy what they need and be assured that it's interoperable and that operations can be harmonized. That's where the value comes in. If we get uncoordinated, if we wind up buying things different in different regions, you run the risk, the economic risk, of overinvesting and not having the full payback that's possible. Benefit, we also draw on the benefits and experience from those that have already taken these steps. That's why the aviation system block upgrade structure was built on the foundation that at least two nations had to have an operational system put in place before we considered that block mature. That gives us organizations, entities that we can reach out to and learn from their past mistakes. We also need to understand, and I think this is probably one of the, the biggest challenges, Nancy Graham touched on it at, at a couple of different levels, but we need to understand the human and the machine relationships because they are evolving and they're evolving quickly. If we look at the new user community, we see that they've probably taken you know, giant steps beyond where we are in the traditional system. The future will be different, and we can almost guarantee it's going to be more complex in the context of where we are today. New operators, the remotely piloted or unmanned uh, platforms, commercial space, high altitude users, etc. All of that's enabled by improved access to information. So we've talked about system-wide information management. We talk about the air ground system-wide information management approach to couple the aircraft into that system, allowing the aircraft to not only be a consumer of information, but also to be a flying sensor to feed the system with improved information to help that decision making. And we have a system of continuous improvement. And that's really where the aviation system block upgrade structure, 
comes to pass because in blocks one to block two to block three, we start describing that continuous improvement structure. The new automation that's being put in place is defined to assist the human, not to replace the human, but to assist the human. But at the same time, we need to recognize that because of the complexity of operations, because of where we're placing things, there will be opportunities for more highly automated systems and ultimately some level of autonomous operations will be in place. We need to understand how the human and the machine fit together. Part of the overall performance-based system optimization includes how we optimize the role of the human as well. There are things that humans are good at and there are things that humans are not good at. A human is not good monitoring an overall automated system. However, if the human has enhanced tasks within that system and is able to make better decisions because of what the automation provides, the information the automation provides, the decisions that are being made, you actually have a much more capable system. So what are some of the biggest challenges we face? There's a perception that the structure that we're talking about is US and Europe centric. And I think that perception, we need to, to break that myth down. Uh, over the years, as we've been developing this, we've had significant contributions from other states. Yes, there were some research lessons that both the US and Europe brought forward to start the process. But the reality is, is Brazil, uh, Japan, Russia, and so on are all key contributors to this process. And as we go forward, there are more and more uh, contributing elements, Canada and so on. The elements of change are designed to allow a scalable solution of interoperable, harmonized building blocks. You have the blocks. It's not a one-size-fits-all. You can adapt from each of those blocks to meet your specific needs. The information exchange models are based on open network exchanges to minimize local and regional solutions. Again, we're looking for a global answer. Another challenge we face is the commitment to change. There's comfort in staying where we are without changing. However, the complexity of operations, the, the overall structure that we live within can't allow that, that reticence to change. We have to look at the economic motivations. As Nancy referenced earlier, we're finding that the economic motivations uh, of the new users are better defined than some of the incremental economic motivations of the traditional system. But there are opportunities for revenue growth out of the system. We have an increase in operations. We have the new entrants bringing new money and new operations to bear. And we have to consider the larger perspective that we are just a cog in, the, in all of the gear structure of a multimodal transportation system, which will further drive the economy as all these pieces fit together. So this impacts the airspace user as well. They may have access to the airspace, but will they have access to the operational benefits? And then from a performance ambition standpoint, one of the key elements we've got is to make sure that everyone has access to the airspace. So we also face the challenge of, do you have the ability to invest? Well, if you follow a globally described path, which is what we've tried to do with the block structures, it makes the investment planning and execution much more affordable. Why? Because you can point to the individual elements and what they bring forward, and you manage the risk of developing your own solution. Knowing that your investment is part of a long-term process ensures that return on investment. So you're not building something today and then become part of that sticky legacy infrastructure that is difficult to change. If you're on that path for change, you know what the next step is and the next step. And again, you're building that to your specific needs. We've been challenged in a lot of hall conversations, and, and I'm, I'll summarize it by saying, I don't know what to do. 
Well, we have guiding documents. The, uh, the Global Air Transport uh, uh, Air Traffic Management Operational Concept sets that vision forward. What are we trying to do? Performance-based, incremental. And the, the Global Air Navigation Plan puts the detail in place for it. It, it becomes the implementation plan for that operational concept. We've got a plan for an orderly implementation. Again, that's the role of the aviation system block upgrades. And the risk is managed because we've put that structure forward that allows you to identify the path and the increment and the technologies, the associated benefits. You can establish then the payback models and so on based on how those blocks have been structured. A very clear approach to making sure that we have the enablers defined, the, the structure of, of information exchange between those that have gone before you, and so on. We talked a little bit. One of the challenges we face is how is the role of the human going to evolve? An air traffic controller becomes more of an airspace manager. We've introduced network management functions and, uh, if you will, flow management, capacity planning, demand capacity balance. We've introduced new roles as this system becomes more complex. But we want to make sure that we're inserting the human into the role that they do the best, not trying to force them into a role where they don't particularly fit well. This also means that training has to evolve. We've learned from some of the studies that have been done recently that controllers aren't ready to make some of these incremental step changes. Pilots aren't ready to take some of these responsibilities on because there have been other pre-described, predefined modes of operation. So the role of the human must evolve. We also face the mixed fleet question, okay? The mixed fleet question, though, is not just an aircraft question. It's also a ground automation question. We have different like, capabilities in ground automation as we travel the world. Again, part of that reason is we don't all need the same degree of complexity. But as change happens, so that we don't have a chicken and egg issue of getting automation ahead of or behind the aircraft, we have to have an integrated plan of how all of those pieces fit together. Part of that is understanding the flow of those aviation system block upgrades and, and understanding the interoperability and harmonized operations that comes forward by that orderly process. We also have the advantage, over time, that older legacy systems, whether they be airborne or ground, will be retired. And when they are retired and replaced, we want to make sure they're replaced with the right growth elements to enable the advanced operations of the future. Change is difficult, absolutely agree. But if you don't have a good story of why change is necessary, it makes our goals unachievable. So in summary, I want to just reflect on the fact that the Global Air Navigation Plan is the implementation toward the vision that was created by the Global Air Traffic Management Operational Concept. It's not done independently, it's done in concert with an overall structure of, of a vision. We want to minimize risk and maximize benefits by adhering to that structured implementation plan. And to quote an old Japanese proverb, vision without action is a daydream, but action without vision is a nightmare. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rick, for uh, sharing your wisdom and uh, for reminding us the, the value of proper planning and, and aligning language and ambitions, and also uh, for the human interface with continuing automation. And I think Captain Jackson will have more to speak about that later. So our next presenter is Mr. Francois Delisle. Uh, Francois is the director of the strategy of uh, the Thales Air Traffic Management Unit. He's in charge of the product policy for automation and CNS systems. So take it over, Francois. Thank you. 
So thank you very much, Mike. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and many thanks to ICAO for giving the industry the, the opportunity to, to present their view on the matter. I selected today uh, two subjects very related to each other. The first, the first point briefly cover what automation brings in terms of interoperability and how it helps the human operator. My second point will address the necessity to improve the collaboration between the different stakeholders and how innovative digital tools can help in this respect. So the first challenge is to foster the deployment of automation in different operating contexts. It could be high density traffic area as a metroplex or low density area as in many places in the world or, or region where many service providers are close to each other as in Europe, for example. So we know by experience that the automation is, is increasing safety, we are in Sinus today, capacity and efficiency. Indeed, it facilitates cross-border operation between neighbors. It improves the collaboration between uh, service providers, airports, airlines, military as well. And last but not least, uh, it makes the human task evolving from routine services to exception handling. So we can say today that SBU Zero technology is mature and is being now largely uh, deployed. But we heard uh, this week that there are still needs for more operator training and procedure development. It's also of interest to consider where we stand in terms of new, new functional capabilities. The point here is to highlight that many progresses on the technology side have been made thanks to R&D programs as CESAR, NextGen, and others. And I gave here some examples of technologies that are ready and that simplify the task of the controller and also facilitate the collaboration between them. Indeed, we can now, and it's what we do with our product, our product Top Sky ATC, reduce minima separation in presence of wave vortex with recat or time-based separation. We can enhance conflict detection and monitoring heads through a better trajectory prediction. We can uh, provide support tools for uh, free route across neighboring FIRs and it improves uh, interoperability between FIRs. And we can also provide tools in order to facilitate flexible use of a space concept, improving the interoperability between military and civil. As well, we can integrate in, in an efficient way flow and traffic management tools at like ATFM, Amman, Demand, and others. Most of the SBU-1 technology has been validated and starts to be implemented. So let's deploy it when and where needed. I mean, when it's supported by a cost-benefit analysis or by a need of interoperability or when safety is at stake. The second key challenge we see is about reinforcing the cooperation between all stakeholders. It means increased interaction between the aviation players, thanks to a shared conops, ensure the interoperability of the system and the exchange of data. In ATM domain, for example, is from ATC to ATC, from ATC to ATFM, from ATFM to ATFM. But it's also between control centers from service provider, airlines, airport, and militaries. And last but, least, but not least, uh, is also having the regulator encouraging the cooperation process. Now we have digital solutions that are available that could enable collaborative aviation operations. So, but what about the complexity of the collaboration? In fact, it arises from different factors. Different stakeholders have different objectives, different priorities, different business models and processes. They have also different regulation and uh, different systems. So, but it comes also from uh, 
different timeline for a given operation. Here we have illustrated the case of a long haul flight, a 12 hour flight, and the timelines of the different stakeholders. I mean airline, airport and ACC of departure, airport and ACC of arrival, successive ATFM and network manager system. And here the colors indicate the different phases. Blue being strategic, yellow being pre-tactical, green tactical. And we see that what is tactical at a given time for one stakeholder is strategic for another. It could seem obvious, but it brings a lot of complexity due to the different sense of urgency in managing an operation. The solution stands in interoperability of system, but not only. It's also a matter of harmonizing regulation, sharing conops and processes, and also to have the right technical infrastructure enabling the services. So, uh, we need a data exchange of high quality uh, to deploy advanced services for aviation, and it could be performed by combining uh, different actions. Implementing swim technology, using an adapted digital platform with the new technologies, and also, which is important, protecting data and being cyber resilient to malicious attacks. This, the service, the advanced services that are enabled by this exchange of data target the major aviation system inefficiency. We heard this morning about 4.5 bi billion of uh, inefficiency. And typically it could be improved through controller efficiency, better uh, optimization of airspace and air sports resources, airline flight operation and schedule reliability. Sure, for sure the uh, SWIM is definitely a, a key enabler for stakeholder collaboration. With the old model, with the legacy model, it's difficult to manage uh, cross-domain uh, integration and communication. And the users are quite isolated with some difficulty to gain new information. With SWIM, with uh, digital modern tools, we can enable cross-domain integration and um, empower users to explore and share and adapt to the needs. But as discussed earlier in, uh, this week in Ganis, they are still work to do on the global standardization side. It's important as well to benefit from a highly performing platform. Thales has developed a, a cloud-based platform called Ecosystem. It's uh, cyber secured, secured, swim interconnected, and is as well powered by uh, big data and uh, artificial intelligence capabilities. And to give you two examples, uh, we, uh, we are experimenting a, a big database engine, uh, improving uh, the, the choice in terms of rerouting capabilities, how to optimize the rerouting, and it's based on a massive recording of routes. Another example is the use of machine learning to better uh, assess, uh, estimate the, the ETA, the estimate estimated time of arrival. So, the platform collects data from different sources, weather, surveillance, AIM, flight plan data, and other. And what does it do? It does, it provides shared situation awareness to the different stakeholders, as you can see them on the top, on the bottom of the, of the, of the slide, airline OCC, ATC, FMP, flow management position, ATC airport, or Airport Operation Center. It, it displays KPIs and alerts customized to each stakeholder. And it also provides mitigation to manage a difficult situation or to optimize traffic. Uh, it could be through ATFM measure and what if scenario assessment. Eventually, it provides a collaborative decision support. But Let's be more concrete. Let's, let's see a, a use case. So uh, here is a view, uh, an ecosystem view, from a flow management position in a ACC system. You have on this view the list uh, of, of aircraft on the top, uh, top left, some sector loads on the right hand side, the red areas are TSA, temporary segregated areas, that are used by military for exercise for a period of time. 
our product ecosystem here is using the B2B services from the European Network Manager and get the TSA areas thanks to the LARA system for your, from your control. But what is the scenario here? Step one, one hour before the execution of the considered flight, a military area that is in the center of the view is freed and released before the, pla the plan time. So, the military uh, operator sent a message to the FMP in order to inform him about this release of airspace. Step two, the FMP, the flow management position guy, benefits of this situation to propose a rerouting with a direct flight. Considering the use of airspace, the sector loading, the potential weather hazard, and what are going to be the level of savings, I mean in terms of time and fuel. So, it does propose through a collaborative process the new route to the airline and to the airport. But, in this case, the airport of destination do not accept the aircraft before the initial time of arrival. It refuse the new ETA because the, the, the airport is already saturated. So, what does the airline do? The airline accepts the direct route, but in order to respect the time of arrival, not creating a problem to the airport, reduce the speed of the air, propose to reduce the speed of the aircraft. So, there is an agreement between the different stakeholders to do it. And a new fly, fly plan is sent to everybody, including the pilot who receives on his electronic fly bag. It's what you can, it's what you can see on the picture on the right, right hand side. So the new fly plan in Europe is sent to the network manager and to, to all of the other guys. Uh, in the rest of the world, it could be sent directly to the ACC and, and uh, airlines. So it's a good example of collaborative making decision facilitated by the local innovative tool. So using such kind of concept and digital tools, it, it, it will bring gain to all stakeholders. Better use of airspace and resource capacity for the service provider and for the airport, saving of fuels and CO2 emission reduction for the airline, and what is important as well is a, for the human in the loop is going to, to be a fast and light workflow for the operators, reducing the complexity of the work for the controller and for the different operator as well for the dispatcher. So to conclude my presentation, I would say that the aviation community is, a, is on the right path towards automation adoption. SBU0 and SBU1 technology in automation will progress system efficiency, efficiency. The innovative tools will enable collaborative data-based services with added value to each stakeholder. But there are still steps required to get the full efficiency. First, we need a deep, to deepen the operator training and to expand the procedure development. There is a need to expand the pioneer successful practices to a larger scale. As, we, as I said before, there is still a need to also to pursue the standard, standard, uh, standardization effort, especially in information management. And we need also, as cyber security is concerned, to have an harmonized view between the different domains in order to, to, to get a, a full cyber resilient systems across the full aviation domain. And last but not least, we are now facing uh, new interoperability challenges with the introduction of UAV in both uh, uncontrolled and controlled space. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Francois, for sharing your uh, experience in implementing and the challenges of it and the importance of uh, taking the right step 
at the right time, and also the importance of uh, collaboration. Our next speaker is uh, Captain Michael Jackson. As an aside, if you do happen to lose his business card, don't look him up in Google. You're bound to fail. So back to Sirius. Mike is the representative of the International Federation of Airline Pilots uh, Associations to ICAO, and we're also very fortunate to have him as an industry observer in the Air Navigation Commission. Mike, over to you. Thanks, Mike. I'm, uh, I'm always looking for innovative ways to tackle the use of my name which is why I go by Mike. Um, anyway, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I must admit that I'm used to making uh, public addresses with everyone seated behind me uh, and not in front of me, but <laughs> we'll give it a go this time. So I'd like to thank you for uh, providing IFALPA a chance to express our views on the challenges the implementation of the Global Air Navigation Plan brings to the professional pilot community. Let me start with a brief overview of our role and priorities going forward as we pilot the world's commercial aircraft to and from all points on the globe. While doing that, I'll bring forward at a high level the challenges we will face with the implementation of the GAMP and what we need in order to meet those challenges. If you ask any airline pilot what their priorities are in order to conduct a safe flight, you'll probably get the answer, aviate, navigate, and communicate. That mantra was true in 1950. It works today, and it will work in 20, 2050. Some of the tools used will change as technology continues to advance. How flight crews manage to do these three priorities continues to evolve. But one thing remains the same. Robust training programs are more important now than ever before. We've been on this path of shifting demands for decades already, where pilots must learn to integrate their flying skills with being a manager of systems and of information. One of the most important assets a pilot has during a flight is the big picture or situational awareness in order to stay ahead of the aircraft and anticipate what lies ahead. Information management is essential in order to keep the big picture. The aircraft we fly are increasingly complex and smart, like the phones in your pockets that if you're like me, you probably don't know what all the functions do, uh, but we can't afford that luxury in the cockpit. These aircraft have been designed and equipped to maximize safety and efficiency while keeping the human in the loop. The systems have been designed with one another in mind with the aim to make managing the overall aircraft intuitive. A thor thorough training and education of these systems is not only essential for safety, but it's a sound investment in efficiency as well. Knowing what each level of automation is capable of, what level is appropriate for the task at hand, and when to change that level of automation is critical. The GAMP does pose some challenges in this regard. With increasing requirements for automation to fly a departure en route and during approach and landing, how can a pilot remain proficient in manual flying skills? With 4D trajectory-based operations development, are we thinking about contingency planning in the event that our day doesn't go as expected? When optimizing our capacity, we have to have plans in place for known and unexpected disruptors, such as convective activity, interruptions to navigation services, and runway closures. The GAMP plays a vital role to facilitate 
interoperability and harmonization when upgrading or developing navigation infrastructure, and if ALPA fully supports its implementation. PBN has been used to successfully provide safer and more direct flight paths on departure, en route, and to final approach, and to provide 3D approaches to runway ends where previously there had not been adequate ground-based systems installed. There remains a significant gap in training and education amongst flight crews worldwide, according to some informal polling amongst our members. The challenge here is to close the gap so that crews are fully knowledgeable on what they have been trained to fly, what the aircraft is certified for, and how to find the right approach in their electronics. Yes, we have crews out there that are flying approaches they have not been trained for and flying approaches the aircraft have not been certified for because of a lack in training in PBN. As we gradually shift from conventional radio navigation aids to GNSS, it's important to find the right pace and balance for this transition. Why? I've said it before. Contingency planning. Cyber attacks and other vulnerabilities which can affect aircraft navigation systems, GNSS or ATC are a real threat. Oxford's Eng English uh, Dictionary defines communicate as share or exchange information, news, or ideas. The challenge for aviation stakeholders from the pilot's perspective is to communicate effectively to be able to send and receive the right information clearly, concisely, and in a timely manner. Implementation of the GAMP should aid in information management, provided the communication methods keep the human in the loop. I think I said that before. Unlike the aircraft frame, which is designed as a whole system from day one, the methods for communication delivery and the prioritization of information content come from multiple sources in the aviation environment. This must be carefully managed in order to prevent an overloaded work environment. The GAMP plays an integral role in this through SWIM. If ALPA is pleased to see in the GAMP that both human factors and cybersecurity have been in the development process. I was asked to talk about uh, the challenges imposed by the integration of unmanned aircraft with manned aircraft, in, in particular, air, unmanned aircraft traffic management, or UTM. Thanks, Olga, for, for <laughs> providing me with that. At the recent Drone Enable, following the RPAS Symposium in September, and at recent uh, presentations that have been given here this week, uh, it shows us what the future UTM may look like in the airspace underneath where most civil aircraft operations occur, and it was fascinating. From FALPA's perspective, our concerns would largely be focused on the contingency planning, another word I've used quite frequently, actually it's two words, but who's counting, for what happens when these UAS don't perform as expected and impinge on the controlled airspace adjacent to them. There needs to be clear lines of communications between ATM and UTM. UTM under controlled airspace will also have to be planned such that commercial and non-commercial traffic such as air ambulances and the like have a safe operating environment coordinated to be free of conflict. Oops. Uh, if ALPA has been involved through its membership in the RPAS panel in the development of SARPs and guidance material for RPAS to ensure the operational perspective of manned aviation is considered, it is critical that all players in non-segregated airspace follow the same sets of rules and regulations. In closing, I'd like to thank ICAO for hosting this event one that has been years in the planning and I think has been very successful. 
And if I can leave you with three points to take away, it would be these. Thorough training programs are more important now than ever before and are a good return on investment. Contingency planning must be taken into account at all levels. And finally, effective communication is critical to, to sew all the parts of the GAMP together to achieve the highest level of success. Thank you. Now watch this. Ah, it didn't work. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. So uh, thank you, Mike, for reminding us how it feels up front there with all this evolution going on and the challenge presented by automation, uh, and especially uh, in the contingency area and the training for it when things go wrong, and they do go wrong. Our fourth speaker is uh, Mr. Kai Chuan Kai. Kai Xuan is an associate professor with the Beihang University in China. He's also the deputy director of the CNS ATM laboratory of the Civil Aviation Administration of China. Welcome to the floor, Professor. Okay, thank you, Mike. <clears throat> uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> and. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here and to share some information from China. And uh, my talk today is about uh, the challenge and the solution uh, <clears throat> in the progress of the Chinese ATM system modernization. And uh, I will start with the demands and challenges we're facing in China. <clears throat> and uh, it's well recognized that the global for global after traffic volume uh, was uh, doubled every uh, 15 years, and it, it will continue to be. And for China, it, uh, from the prediction from CAC ATMB, that's the Air Traffic Management Bureau, and it's expected that the air traffic volume in China will be tripled in next 15 years. So actually, in <clears throat> last uh, 11 years, ranging from 2006 and 2016, and uh, the we, the air traffic volume in China has already made a triple. Uh, and while the ATM community in China has suffering for years for the growing pains, we can find from the figure, the red line, is that indicated the on-time performance uh, from 2009. It's dropping down year by year until 2016. And hopefully, great efforts have been made in 2016, and the, <clears throat> the on-time performance will improve. And but for a long time perspective, so the stress and the change on the existing ATM system is still remarkable. So look uh, deep into the current situation in China, and in the eastern area. There's the almost uh, nearly, I think, 80% uh, of air traffic are distributed in this area. And uh, it, there's famous tr busy triangles, for example, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, in the east. And in the mid, we have uh, Beijing, Chengdu, Kunming. And uh, due to the limited uh, uh, civil airspace resource in, in this area, and the traffic congestion and the consequent flight delay are inevitable. And while looking at the western part, in the western area, uh, nearly half of the land are covered by desert and Prato. There are 14 high Prato airports in these areas. And uh, in this area, it's difficult to deploy ground-based CSATM <coughs> facilities. So which lead to the lack of air traffic service or even the flight efficiency. So that's the two main challenges we are facing now in China. And uh, there also with the popularization of the UAVs, <coughs> it comes out new challenges. So it's statistic by the CAC that in the this year, and half the first half of this year, there are 14 incidents 
of the UAV interference uh, were reported. And the 790 flights were impacted. And we, some are uh, canceled or some delayed. And uh, this number is much more big than uh, the, the, the year of 2016. So especially in Chengdu airports, in April of this year, nine incidents have been reported in 70 days. So thousands of pas passengers are, are stranded in the airports. So that's a really big challenges, and uh, it came to a, it became a headache to the aviation regulators. So how to solve such kind of the conquer such kind of challenges? And uh, basically, I'd, I'd like to share some information from the CAC. That's basically there are three levels. I think uh, the first level is strategic way, and uh, the second one is technical solution, and the, the last one for regulation solution. And uh, for strategic one, actually, uh, CAC in 2008, CAC has proposed a strategic plan of building China's civil aviation power. And in, the, in this plan, ATM system modernization has been set as a top priority. And uh, for the ATM, a ATMB, they have to take some specific actions. And they, in 2015, it, uh, the ATM strategic development outline was proposed. And uh, in this outline, the camps, that is the China Civil Aviation ATM modernization strategy was firstly uh, proposed. And also, just after last year, uh, year, last year the system architecture of the camps have started to, to be designed. And uh, the camps, of course, it's uh, developed based on the reality of the ATM reality of China, but it's also in line with the, the ICAO docs, for example, the GetMock and the, the GAMP. And the, the performance goals of the camps in 2030 are targeted as following four aspects. For the safety, it is expected to improve the, by a factor of 20 uh, in 2030. And for if efficiency, the delay is expected to, uh, due to the ATM, is expected to reduce to five minutes. And for capacity, of course, it needs to triple that. And uh, of, of from the, the greenness, the environmental uh, aspect, it uh, will be enable a 10 percentage of reduction in the effect of flights have on the environment. So in these uh, camps, so the six ar architecture, of course, is very critical. And it uh, should be a blueprint to realize the, the camps. And uh, we hope that we can get the, the outcome from the camps for example, the roadmaps, the programming, planning, and the investment plan. And ATMB used the DODAF version 2 to develop the, the system architecture. And uh, it, it, it's organized into four views, which are capability view, operation view, technology view, and system view. And here's uh, some attention to the, this four view. Among these four view, I think the one most important view is the operational view, which should de describe uh, the difference between legacy ATM system and uh, uh, CAMS. So, according to the, the GetMark and the GAMP, ATM have de designed the following operating concepts here. And uh, <clears throat> the first one, uh, we have, uh, I think, have uh, eight components here. The first one is the airspace organization management. And the second one is the collaborative traffic flow management. And the third one is the high density air drum operations. And the fourth one is TBO. And the fifth one is multi-mode separation management. And the sixth one is the civil military joint operation. And the last of, uh, one in the circle is the PBS, performance-based service. So these seven components are connected or enabled by the information management components. 
So besides the strategic, we also have uh, some uh, ATM activities from technical way in parallel uh, launched. And uh, especially here, we have a CAC most. Most is Ministry of the Science and Technology of China. They have a joint initiative to s launch some project. For example, f from 2006, the first project is National ATM System. And in this project, the PBN, ADSB, traffic flow management, ATC automation, and the RVSM were, were covered. And the second one is the, the CATM, collaborative ATM system. And uh, here we have GBUS, ASM, GCS, CDM, PDCDATs, and uh, also flight service station for general aviation. And the last one is the ongoing project, what we call the I4D flight trial and validation. And here we may focus on the, the ATM B2 and uh, the I4D ATC automation. And uh, yeah, the purpose of this project is to evaluate the uh, expected performance of uh, I4D concept, for example, the, the RTA capability, and also the enhanced air ground uh, uh, automation and the trajectory syn synchronization. And it's uh, also expect to prepare for the invested I4D or even 4D operation. So it's planned to have the first uh, I4D flight trial uh, in, at the end of the next, next year. And uh, we have a partnership, partnership with Airbus, and uh, we will use the A320 test aircraft to fly the, f the route from uh, Tianjin Airport to Guangzhou Airport and to demonstrate and validate our I-40 concepts. So, yeah, besides the, the, the technical part, there are also some regulation have been developed uh, to especially to f focus some emergency or, or hot top uh, issues, for example, UAS. And there's several regulations have been made in recent years. For example, the UAS holder registration and the UAS operator management of also the small UAS operation and the UAS air traffic management. So let's offer the, the the strategy and solution for this part. And uh, finally, I would like to conclude my uh, presentation. So in order to accommodate the expanding HF demand and the, the consequent uh, the, the challenges, China has already paid great attention to ATM system modernization. And uh, of course, it should be, the camps should be subject to the, the ICAO GAMP original plans. And uh, it's also important to camps to make it, the camps to globally harmonized. And also looking ahead, long term and the continuous efforts to be made to change camps from the, the strategy to reality. And uh, thank you. That's all for my presentation. Thank you all. Thank you, Professor, for taking us through the hurdles of uh, strategic planning in a state with one of the highest growth rates in aviation. Interesting, it's the first step of building political power as the foundation for success. We have heard this before yesterday and, and earlier today. Okay, so now comes the best part. We now want to listen to you. Be challenging, be defiant, be bold. Uh, this is how we, we build the knowledge that we'll be able to take forward from, uh, from this gathering. So uh, I would like to know, would anyone uh, like to initiate a dialogue with our speakers? Gentlemen up front. So I have a question for um, Don Jacques Ferra, who was a speaker before, so you know me already. Uh, I have a speaker for uh, a question for um, Mike on uh, the training. What is uh, IFALPA view? Where the training should come from? The OEM, the airlines, ICAO, anyone else? 
Um, thanks for the question. I, I think um, training starts at the top, so uh, it would be certainly uh, good to start it here, but uh, it trickles down through the regulators and, and in, into the airlines. The airlines themselves uh, are primarily responsible for making sure that their crews are thoroughly trained to, uh, in PBN to fly the aircraft. Thank you very much. Uh, gentlemen in the middle there. Thank you very much, uh, everybody. Good morning. My name is uh, Tim Price. I'm a, an Airbus 320 captain with British Airways and the regulations manager in the flight operations department. I'm, I'm grateful to you for your presentations. I have a, an observation and a question. So the observation is, I think the operators, and in particular the aircraft, are data rich already. Uh, we could provide data before an aircraft even turns a wheel on the projected flight in the pre-tactical phase that are accurate to within 1%. And uh, when a Boeing 777 is flying in the London TMA, it's navigating to an accuracy within its own wingspan. Yet these data are unusable. Moreover, we have been recently retiring air aircraft which have on them equipment which has been fitted by mandate and therefore with, for which we've had to pay, but that, air, that equipment has never been used in anger. Uh, I noticed that uh, Mr. Tim Murphy from uh, Boeing is sitting at the front and the other day at the beginning of the Gannis, he, de he defined uh, equipment mandates and I quote, as a declaration of failure. So therefore, I'm afraid I only was able to come in halfway through Mr. Heinrich's presentation, but he strongly supported um, the notion of moving forwards in a collaborative fashion. Uh, and I would echo that remark. So those are my observations. Uh, my question is, to what extent does the panel think the GAMP and the ASBUs have global traction? And the reason I ask is because, unfortunately, it seems that some of the airspace change mandates and proposals which we're seeing don't appear to be following the GAMP or the ASBUs. So what could ICAO do about that? And Mike, I'm trying to be challenging to um, follow your challenge. Thank you, gentlemen, for a very interesting session. Thank you, Tim. And uh, I hadn't recognized you from here, eyesight problem, but I did recognize your voice when you came in. Yes, these are challenges, and, and maybe I would pass those uh, questions. Uh, mind you, they can be responded by the audience too, okay? So if there's someone in the audience who thinks they can uh, respond to the question, feel free to do so. But I'll, I'll, I'll start with, uh, with Rick. I appreciate your observation, and, and I think it's events like this that are helping spread the word um, about how we keep the aircraft, the ground automation, uh, airports, um, the need for training, the dimensions of training and so on. I think that's the information exchange we're looking for here. Um, bringing industry forward to identify uh, the kinds of issues. We have a very broad uh, technical participant base in the development of the aviation system block upgrades. Um, we have participation from a variety of member states in terms of their uh, automation programs. And I think if you look, uh, and I'll call this a bit regionally, um, there are implementation programs for some of these. I think the challenge comes in, it goes back to some of the challenges that I had raised, um, that's, you know, what do I do first? What do I do second? And we have to find a way for industry to collaborate with each other to take this forward. And again, I think venues like this uh, are are an opportunity for the networking, the hall conversations of what did you do, how did you do it, how can I benefit from that? So um, I don't know that there's a formal process per se. I mean, we have the PERGs, we have the regional activities and so on, um, which will uh, you know, take some of the core information and start taking it to the regions. Uh, we have to find maybe a more effective way to do that. Uh, that would be, I guess, maybe an observation on my part. Anyone else from the panel? Anyone from the audience would, uh, would like to add to the comment? Uh, 
Yes, Tim, if, if I can add something, obviously uh, you are a member of an ICAO panel, and uh, there, there are a number of entry points where we, we, we can make our voices heard. We'll, we'll comment a little more about that later when we look at the conclusions of, uh, uh, of the segment here. But yeah, there might be some missing entry points there that we need to, and, and, and as Rick well said, I mean, this, this is one of the opportunities to air it, and, and we're doing it. Uh, anyone else? Yes, sir. Hello, yes. Good morning. Uh, Christophe Amel, Wiesel Free in the US. I guess one of the answers to that is um, how do we implement nationally first? And uh, one of the things we can see, and echoing what uh, this gentleman from uh, Tim Price, uh, Tim uh, from uh, uh, British Airways was saying, is we have a couple of examples uh, where we started, the airlines were mandated or started to equip, and at the end of the day, the ANSP didn't, for good reasons, very, uh, most of the time, could not deliver their share on the ground side, right? So, so I guess there is a, a, a kind of iterative process or perhaps a, 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 a process whereby uh, the ground piece or the ANSPs uh, should be uh, mandated in some ways to commit on their piece so the, the development happens when the airlines are ready and therefore that would be driven, that would be you know, translated into what we do with IKO and, and the blocks and so forth in a much better fashion. I think uh, I have an example which is ADSB out, ADSB in, in the US, where now all the aircraft are going to be equipped in 2020 and for lack of budget in the, in the, in the FAA budget, there will be no, no additional development for the time being. We are working on it, obviously, to, to change the course of history. But after 2020, there is no more budget in the next gen budget to work on ADSB in. So that's where we, and, and the benefits are for the airline with ADSB in, not with ADSB out. So that's one of the examples where we, we need to have some strong commitment on both ends before we can bring that, I guess, to, to IKO and, and the SBOOS. For sure, and, and, and as we evolve in automation, the aircraft becomes more and more a part of ATM, and that integral part has to be thought of as we uh, evolve. Any other question? Yes, gentleman up front here. Yes, thank you very much, and thank you for the enlightening uh, panel. I would like to raise a question, maybe a comment to uh, Captain Mike uh, on behalf of uh, IFALPA. Uh, I'm from uh, the Civil Aviation Authority of Israel and we keep uh, face uh, some objections and, uh, from the local pilot associations that keep formally opposed and in written uh, to the PBN uh, uh, landing procedures. Keep telling us that the best way and the most uh, efficient, not efficient, but a safe way for landing is vectors to ILS. It's, it's a kind of uh, opposing the, the trend. Is that reflect the uh, international uh, uh, ways or, or th thoughts of the international association? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks for the question. Um, just out of curiosity, does that have to do with some of the RNAV visuals that go into Tel Aviv? Well, you are right. It used to be, but now we have fully uh, uh, PBN, real PBN um, implementation uh, for all the international uh, landing or for the only international uh, uh, use uh, runways. So it shouldn't be, and there's no priority to use the ARNA visual approaches. Okay, well, um, our, our view is provided you have um, sufficient training in place that we are certainly proponents of um, PBN implementation. Uh, but there's a lack of harmonization right now globally on the mix of, uh, of PBN with visual procedures, and, and ICAO is working uh, on that, and, and it's progressing uh, 
I would say probably about halfway there at this point with trying to come up with a, a standardized way of doing mixing PBN with visual approaches. Once that's done, then the harmonization itself should uh, help in their acceptance, I, I would imagine, because right now different states are implementing that in different ways with a lack of standards in place. Okay, uh, Rick, would you have a comment? Yeah, I think we've touched I think we've touched on this one a couple of times now, and, and maybe there's a, a parallel comment to make. I mean, we talk about training, the need for training, both uh, from the, the ground side, from the airborne side, and so on. I think what's important about the training is to help resolve a cultural issue. And what I'm referring to in the cultural issue is we have traditional a perception of traditional roles and responsibilities. The controller's role is separation management. The, the pilot's operation is a safe operation of the aircraft and so on. And, and I think we've maybe created some boundaries that need to evolve. Training will help that evolution, but I also think we've got to move beyond um, a, a hard traditional boundary on some of these. As we introduce different kinds of platforms, unmanned platforms, for example, the, the notions of delegated separation or, or the ability to hand off functionality and capability back and forth between the, the players in the system, that to me is what's holding us back more than the technology. We have technologies that we can take advantage of. We just, we haven't appropriately trained or conditioned the, the human side in the system to take advantage of those tools. Uh, we can cite numerous examples. I mean, the, the FMS and the aircraft can uh, calculate required time of arrival with extreme accuracy, but we choose not to take advantage of it because of, uh, of traditional, um, you know, if you will, management of a specific aircraft trajectory by the controller to manage arrival rates and so on. I think those are the kinds of things that have to evolve to allow the, the technical elements of the blocks that we've described to become operational. If we don't deal with those kinds of things, we will have a, a wonderful toolbox of technology that won't be implemented. Thanks, Rick. Uh, any other question? If not, I will use my privileges of a facilitator to ask one. <laughs> okay, I'll get there after mine. <laughs> uh, Professor Kai Huan, uh, an issue that called attention on your presentation was a large amount of airspace exclusively dedicated to military operations. It's also the case in other parts of the world. It, it, it's not exclusive to your state. Uh, understanding there are legitimate needs for training and other missions for the military, we wonder if there's not more we can do to sensitize authorities on the need for sharing airspace. Uh, can you explain a little about the civil military joint operation component in the CAMs in China? Okay, <clears throat> thank you for your question. Yes, actually the uh, airspace, uh, limited airspace issue is always the, the, I mean, the hot spots in China. And uh, <clears throat> right now, actually, uh, in, as I, 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 I mentioned in the camps, the first one is a, con a component of the concept is the, the AOM, airspace, and uh, the uh, organization and the management. And uh, we're try trying to move into a way of the f actually flexible use of the airspace and dynamic the use of the airspace to try to improve the uh, utilization and the efficiency of the airspace. And uh, actually, we are also on the road right now. And uh, <clears throat> for the civil aviation in China and also the military aviation in China. They are working together right now and they try to provide some uh, what we call temporary routes 
released by the civil, uh, civil uh, military av aviation. And the temporary, temporary route, which we also call the continu <coughs> conditional routes, and then the quantity of the routes have been become more and more. And uh, that means that uh, it can provide more capacity for the civil aviation. So uh, let's uh, I understand it, it's the uh, right direction. Uh, the CAC and the military aviation move forwards. And uh, besides for the civil aviation and the military joint operation, <coughs> and uh, also is one, I think it featured uh, concept component in camps. And uh, uh, there we are talking about uh, the joint operation. What kind of joint operation? Maybe one day the controller from the civil aviation and the military aviation, they are working in the same place. But it's just a proposal right now, but they are working uh, for, 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 the for, for the girl. And uh, <clears throat> also the information between the military and the civil aviation may be shared to more to deep extent, and uh, as well as the, 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 the training, the, the assistance, and the, the, the regulations. So that's the, I think that's the goal of the, 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 the civil aviation and the, the military aviation are put, putting forward. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> uh, there was a gentleman at the back that, uh, yes, go ahead. The other JF. <laughs> yeah. So Jean-Francois Gou Ayata. Um, I've been involved you know, in the GAMP update process, so I have a question both to Francois and Rick, uh, because you know, in that update process, the question is, you know, are we providing all the information required? So I was wondering, you know, from your point of view, is there enough information for both the ground automation people and the aircraft you know, designers to understand what they have to provide in support of the implementation of the GAMP modules? Thank you. I didn't plant that question, but uh, I'll be speaking about that in the end. Uh, does anyone want to respond? So, Jean-Francois, thank you. Um, I believe the information is there. I'm not sure that the community uh, today knows how to access the information. And I am encouraged by the web-based approach that's being taken because I think it will be it will make it easier to access that information, and and track the correlation between the ground initiatives, the airborne initiatives, and so on. Um, the good news to me is, especially on the early blocks, the block zero, block one, and and ultimately what we're trying to accomplish with block two, we're really trying to write down what we have today and to take advantage of it and to improve operations. Um, when we get further out in the other blocks, it's less well-defined, but it, it's on a trajectory, a path, if you will. So I think the information is available uh, because we've used that knowledge that we have, your, yourself you know, has been a key contributor as well, um, to, to make sure that we've got um, the end-to-end -end story included. We may not be as effective including all of the elements, like maybe airports and so on, but I think from the core aircraft and air traffic management standpoint, I think we do have um, a well-formed story. How someone accesses it, again, it's back to vehicles like this where we're bringing industry forward. Um, we've got to have a way... Uh, of, of better informing the regional uh, activities and so on so that they can take those forward. We recognize that this is not a one-size-fits-all, okay? So there will be increments of how someone chooses to, uh, to buy in, if you will, but I believe the building blocks are there. Francois? <clears throat> Thank you, Mike. Yes, Rick, I fully share your view. I would say, uh, as far as uh, SB0 and SB1 is concerned, I think concept-wise and technology-wise, it's fine, it's known. 
I might have some reservation on ASB1, not on the technical and the conceptual side, but on the CBA side. And when discussing with some service provider around the world, some people are still uh, questioning uh, what's going to really bring to me in my case. And maybe we are lacking some, uh, um, some business consideration in this part. With regard to um, SB2, Number two, yes, I think there are still some work to do on some concepts in order to make sure that uh, the technology we can deliver will uh, eventually uh, deliver what is expected. Thank you, uh, Jean-Francois. So uh, I think we're coming now to the close of this session. And uh, what I'd like here was uh, to leave some questions that come to mind, and, and <clears throat> sorry, and mind you, these are not directed at IKEA only, but to all of us here who are part of this fascinating world of aviation. Do we need to be more inclusive in our standard making process? Are we listening to all the players that are required and at the right time as we go on in the process of producing these plans. Have we brought our global plans to the detail of execution? And this goes to the last question asked by Jean-Francois Grou. Have we brought our global plans to the detail of execution that would allow for a truly global implementation? Do we need to make them more understandable to those who actually need to make them work at all levels? of development. During the introductory session, the Secretary General spoke briefly about the Industry High Level Group and our efforts uh, to raise awareness of the value of aviation to decision-making authorities, and this was touched upon here too. Uh, interesting aspect of uh, the, the presentation uh, from CACUAN that uh, they're creating a political part and, and foundation before they even initiate the exercise. Do we need to do more in order to encourage investment and reduce unnecessary barriers to the efficient use of airspace? Although being very proud of our achievements in ATM, is it time to give serious consideration to the impact new technologies and new players might have on the way we've been planning? to use our airspace so far. I'll leave those with you and uh, we'll carry on with the questions as we go forward in the stream. Uh, please don't miss uh, the second part of it in the afternoon. And uh, I would like very much to thank our speakers for their uh, presentations and, and, and you in the audience for actually having uh, participated in this. I see a lot of hungry faces in the room. so. Uh, I think it's time for us to go to lunch. There's no specific sponsor, so thank you, Ikeo, for feeding us. And have a good lunch. <laughs>